Meet the cast. Me, idiot mom with no manners, not super entitled kid, but still. And finally, the dad who was just a helpless husband. It was a normal Saturday night, and I was working at my job. I work at a major retail store. Not going to say the name, but it rhymes with souls. The rush we get on most Saturdays had calmed down, and my coworker and I were just straightening the floor. She works the registers while I'm a floor person. We were folding down the floor when our entitled mother, entitled kid and the dad, came in. Now, for context, our store has two wheelchairs for customers who need them to use freely. I have a particular protective stance on them, as my sister also uses one on her bad days due to her multiple sclerosis and people like to misuse them. And here's where our fun story really begins. The entitled kid was a boy of around 12 and had literally run into the store all smiles and laughs. Then his eyes zero in on the wheelchair. He goes to grab it and I make my way over to the family and stand slightly in front of the wheelchair. Me. Hello and welcome to Store X. My name is Jim Milton. Can I help you find anything? The kid backs off due to my arrival while the parents tell me they're clothes shopping for the kid. They grab a cart and all head off towards the kid's section. I go to check on the rest of the floor and to fold where needed. It was a little over five minutes later I watched the kid zoom back, snatch the wheelchair and take off. I'm pissed and was ready to chase after him, but a lady needed help getting something off a of man a queen, so I put it out of my mind. An hour later, my coworker needed to take her break and I offered to cover her. She hadn't been gone for two minutes when who came to check out. Yup, the entitled mother, entitled kid, and the dad, but you know what isn't there? The wheelchair? I'm mad. Not only did he take a piece of equipment he honestly didn't need, but left it God knows where in the store. I'm not about to let that fly. Me. Hello? Did you find everything okay? Entitled mother? Yeah, but your kid's area is really messy. Liar. My other coworker who works in that department is beyond OCD and never lets a mess sit. But I ignore that and press on to what I really want to know. I look at the entitled kid. Me. Where is the wheelchair? Entitled. Kid looks confused. What? The wheelchair I saw you take earlier. Where is it? If it's not in use, it has to be by the front door. His eyes go wide. He knows he's caught. But the entitled mother doesn't get it. My son doesn't know anything about a wheelchair. He isn't a disabled person. He's actually useful. Wow. I can't believe she just said that. Neither can the dad, it seems, as he looks at his wife with a mixture of disgust and confusion. The dad. Honey, our kid was riding it. She interrupts him. Be quiet. Be quiet. Okay, so now I know what's going on. Clearly, she knew her kid had used it, but didn't care about where he left it. I look back to the entitled kid and with my stern but still friendly customer voice, I tell him, please go bring it back. We have customers who come in and have to use them to get around. The kid just nods and scurries off back the way they came. The dad doesn't look irritated, but the entitled mother is mad. It was not your job to tell him what to do. Ma'am, my job is to ensure that all customers have their needs met while they are shopping. I can't do that if the crucial equipment for our handicapped customers is not where they can be easily accessed. Giving up on trying to act clueless, she replied. He was just playing with it. He wasn't hurting anyone. Wheelchairs are not toys, ma'am. And he shouldn't be playing with them. She goes quiet, obviously trying to come up with something clever to throw back at me. Failing that, she goes to the classic Karen response. I want your manager shrugging and staying calm as my manager on duty is a no-nonsense type of person, I say. No problem. Then you can explain to her how your child was misusing store property and you were trying to lie to me about him doing so. If you really want to push this further, I can ask for her to look at our security tapes. Before I can grab my walkie, the dad puts his hands up in a defensive motion. That's not necessary. I apologize for my son and wife. He turns to the entitled mother. Just stop. She's only doing her job and I told you back there that our kid shouldn't have had it. He was just plain. The dad and me at the same time. It's not a toy. By the time I'm finished bagging their items, the kid has come back pushing the wheelchair back to where he had taken it from. He rejoined his parents and said a quiet sorry to me before they all left the store. The entitled mother glaring daggers at me the whole way. I told my coworker when she got back and we both had a laugh about it. Morale of the story, don't play with wheelchairs. Many moons ago, I spent my youth in the army. I worked in comms and spent some excellent years doing dumb shit. With some of the best guys and girls you could ever meet. One of those years of my misspent youth, I was deployed to a hot and sandy location. This length of deployment was unusual for me, as most deployments in the British Army are six months. The extra time was due to us being one of the first units deployed, and after supporting the initial deployment, they requested volunteers to remain and support and train some of the relieving units and newly deployed logistics headquarters. At this stage in my career, I had been lucky enough to jump from deployment to deployment and I was loving the extra money that that gave me, so I happily volunteered to stay. I was tasked with supporting one of the logistics headquarters. I'd run that detachment earlier in the deployment, 
and was happy to return as it was far away from the main headquarters and all of the bored adults and seniors that the headquarters bring. Think sweeping the desert, that kind of thing. Our little detachment was a oasis in a sea of nonsense. It was just six guys and girls with me as the detachment commander. I was a corporal at the time. The isolated nature of our debt meant that anyone sent there had to be able to operate independently, be very adaptable, and open to improvise to support where required. Our main unit also liked to send us their troublemakers. But due to the nature of the debt, they could only send us people who could do their role also. So I ended up with all the best and most interesting scum on my unit, and it was amazing. For any Yanks reading, it would have been an E4 Mafia paradise. Within weeks, we had a patio and rock garden set up. We had a barbique pit, shower area, gym. We'd sorted a deal with the local civilian contractors for us to receive beer in exchange for our help in vehicle and generator servicing. The best part was due to us being in comms debt. It was restricted entry to our area, so we were free from any surprise visits. Now that I've set out the backstory, I'll get onto malicious compliance. The headquarters we were supporting was regularly rotating its senior non-commissioned officers, SENCO, and officers from the deployment. They'd do the minimum time to qualify for a medal, and they'd, they'd get replaced with someone new. It was a shitty practice that eventually got shut down, but not the much later deployments. We were fairly used to this by now, and the only overhead we had at creating new accounts for the seniors. The guys who actually did the work, my peer group in the headquarters, stayed the same, mostly. This latest rotation saw the old regimental quartermaster sergeant being replaced by a newly promoted regimental quartermaster sergeant. This new guy was a prick, full of his own self-importance. Hated that we had a little island of bullshit-free tranquility within his eyesight. I'd see him pacing outside our fence line when he first arrived, unable to comprehend that he wasn't allowed to just walk in. By this point, I'd been in this location for about six months and was thoroughly past the point of giving any damn. The regimental quartermaster sergeant hated that he had to deal with me, a lowly full screw as OC of the debt, and myself and crew of reprobates was out of his chain of command. One day he absolutely lost his shit because we were barbecuing half a goat and had invited a few of his guys to join us after work for some beers and delicious goat wraps. By this stage, we'd use Hessian to fence off our BBK and bar area so that we could obscure it from prying eyes. He went off to get some of his unit's regimental police. For peas, these are not real military police, just jobs worth with no real job in a unit, to come and shut us down. I told them to jog on. They weren't getting in my debt, and I don't care who sent them. Apparently, the next day, he was apoplectic. The guys who worked with him warned us he was determined to bring my debt to heel. His solution was removing our welfare package that we were issued through his department as a favor from his guys for some services that we were providing. It consisted of a small fridge, TV, and British Forces Broadcasting Service TV decoder, BFB's, box. The conversation went roughly as thus. Regimental Quartermaster Sergeant, Corporal Tosspot, it appears that there has been a paperwork error, and you have been given one of my welfare packages by mistake. Me. Okay, sir. I'd be happy to fill that in. Shall I drop by your office? Sergeant, you can drop by my office and bring the package, but you won't be filling in any paperwork. You may have wrangled the last RQ, but as far as I'm concerned, you lock and do one if you think you're getting that welfare package back off me. And if there's anything else that I find that isn't 100% correct paperwork-wise, then I'd be shutting that right down. You may not be mine, and I may not be able to enter you little compound, but I'm going to have you, son. Every resup demand, every transport request better be completed correctly. I'm going to make your lives hell with paperwork and admin. Q, malicious compliance. Me. I'm sorry to hear that, sir. I'm sorry you feel the service that we provide isn't good enough. The old sergeant was very happy with services that he was getting from us and sent over the spare welfare package as a thank you. Are you sure that it's paperwork that's the issue here? Are you not happy with phones and the internet? Sergeant. Corporal. I have not complaints regarding the comms. You just need to complete the correct paperwork and have it authorized by me. At this point, it is clear that he is never going to authorize the return of the welfare package and is very smug about it. Me. Okay, sir, you're of course correct. Paperwork is essential. Sergeant, are you giving me attitude, Corporal? Me. Not at all, sir. Just agreeing with you. To be clear, you are happy with everything else we provide to the headquarters. You just want me to complete the correct paperwork? Sergeant. That's correct, Corporal. Me. No problem, sir. Happy to oblige. I delivered the welfare package back to his stores. His guys were very apologetic. I told them not to worry. You see, the welfare package was a thank you for all the extra phone lines and terminals that we'd provided for the previous sergeants. These expanded his and his unit's working capacity. Most importantly, I had run phone line to the sleeping area so that him and his lads could call home without using their limited welfare phone cards. I'd also laid some precious unfiltered internet lines to 
internet to deployed units is very rare, and unfiltered internet is almost unheard of for British units. What I was providing was immense value to lonely squaddies, and it was also without paperwork. When I got back to my debt, I flicked a couple of switches, turning off all the paperwork less connections. I waited for the inevitable. It didn't take long. The first visitor was one of the privates, letting us know that he'd been cut off mid-call back home. I apologized and explained what was going on with the sergeant. He understood not happy about it, but understood. He went off muttering about throbbers who can't leave well enough alone. The next was one of the sergeant full screws, who I have a lot of time for. She came around and asked what was going on with the comms. She was in the office when I had the conversation with the, the sergeant earlier. We had a bit of chat about what a belter he is, and then she asked what was going on. I explained that as per the sergeant's request, we are following his example and doing things by the book, and I've turned off all services without the correct paperwork. She looked at me knowingly. So what does that mean? She asked. I explained that the only services that I had been ordered to provide were for the headquarters. The rest would have to request them through me and be approved by division headquarters as per orders. I handed her a copy of the request forms to be completed in triplicate as I didn't have a photocopier and they couldn't send me it by email as I just turned their kit off. She had a bit of a chuckle and went off back to her boss, paperwork in hand. You see, the only orders I had were for the six lines and terminal in the headquarters. The 30-odd lines I'd laid extra were essentially me being a good bloke and supporting the mission and departments as they grew around the hop. It was initiative and adaptability on my part. These were all now off, and I had a steady stream of visitors throughout the day wanting to know what was going on. I directed them all to sergeant, who had the request forms. My last visitor was the operations captain. He was a top bloke, a late entry, Lee, officer, had gone through the ranks from private to regimental sergeant major, SCM, and was now commissioned as an officer, who had spent more than a few nights in our compound with a beer and talking shit with us. He was one of the very first recipients of a private line and internet, he asked me what was going on. He'd been round the houses, so he knew there were shenanigans afoot. I told him the situation. His face dropped. Leave it with me is all that he said, and off he went. Thirty minutes later, the sergeant was back at the entrance to my compound with the welfare package. The ops captain was with him, looming over him as only ARSM, or former RSM in this case. Can! Me. Hello, sir. How can I help? Sergeant. Very sheepishly. Hello, corporal. There seems to have been an error, and we found your paperwork for the welfare package. So I'm returning it, with my apologies. Me. No need to apologize, sir. Easy mistake to make. Sergeant. So, are we good? Me. And the other paperwork moving forward? Sergeant, there's no need for all that. Looking over his shoulder at the ops captain, we are, after all, on the same team. Me. We're indeed, sir. I look over my shoulder and give one of my guys a nod. I think you'll find everything is now back to as it was. Sergeant, excellent. Thank you very much, Corporal. And off he went? The ops captain stared daggers at him as he left. He just gave me a nod and confirmed that drinks were still on for the next day and toddled off back to his pit. I was never bothered by the sergeant again. So, I just got home and finished half of my replacement pizza and thought that I'd share why I have to refer to it as a replacement pizza. So, there's a pizza place close to where I live, and sometimes after a long day at work, I'm not in the mood to cook. So I place an order on their app for takeout when I leave work and pick it up on my way home. Normally, it goes off without a hitch. Sometimes I even get there right as they cut it and place it in their warming bag. Today, however, things just weren't going my way. As I finally got there, the delivery guy was on his way out, important later. And when I was on my way back to my car, up came the blind Karen. Apparently, she thinks I'm a delivery driver and that they all wear business casual. I'm opening my door and my pizza on the roof of my car as she stomps up to me and starts yelling, I don't register what she's saying at first. Long day at the end of a long week with little sleep, but apparently she had ordered delivery, and the guy hadn't delivered it yet, and her little brats at home were hungry. I managed to get a word in while she takes a breath and try to explain that I'm not the delivery guy, but Karen isn't having any of it. She then stops yelling and grabs my pizza off of the roof of my car, thinking it's hers. She takes one look at it, realizes it isn't hers, and throws it on the ground. I'm standing there, still a bit shocked at her behavior, when she opens the passenger side door of my car and gets in, apparently looking for more. I finally snap into action and go around and drag her out of my car, and, knowing he had already left, tell her to go inside and yell at the delivery guy. She apparently accepts now that I'm not the delivery guy, and without saying a word, stomps inside, leaving me out there with a pizza with extra pavement for a topping. Not willing to give her the benefit of getting away with this nonsense, I follow her inside, curious as to how the staff will handle this, and to get another pizza. She is mid-screech already as I walk in and stand by the door. Apparently, she doesn't believe that the delivery guy already left because the jerk outside said he was. 
The guy at the counter, Bob, who's worked there for a few years and is a nice guy, sees me by the door and asks if she's telling the truth. I simply tell him the witch is crazy and owes me a pizza. Bob then assures her that the delivery guy left five minutes ago, and apparently she accepts this and starts to walk to the doors. Bob then chimes in and says that since she wouldn't be able to get home before the delivery guy made it there, she could pay here and he'd tell him to just leave it and run. She agrees, mumbling something about them not being as stupid as she thought, though she apparently had a problem with the amount, which wasn't what she was quoted on the phone. Bob told her what was on the receipt, her extra-large vegetarian pizza, a two-liter of Pepsi, my large pizza, and one of those big cookies. Karen goes crazy at Bob, asking what he was thinking, trying to pull that. Bob, somehow managing to keep a straight face, asks her if what I said was true, to which she replies, so what if it is? Bob just says, you break it, you bought it, Simple as that, and Karen then, in a huff, turns to try and apparently run away and try and get home in time, but stops dead when she realizes I'm still standing there by the door. I just motion with my fingers for her to turn back around and pay, and Bob adds that he can always call the driver and have him lose the pizza. She looks genuinely shocked and said we were trying to blackmail her over a pizza, really? After a minute of pouting, she caved and paid, swearing at us the whole time. She then stomps out gets back into her car and peels out of the parking lot like she was being chased by the cops, and Bob tells me that my new pizza will be about 12 minutes. He then says he added the cookie as a way of apologizing for her and was surprised that she didn't notice it, and also said he'd go back and void my original order to give me a refund. We laugh and eventually I get a fresh, hot replacement pizza and the cookie and go on my way after thanking Bob again for dealing with her the way he did. While writing this up, I realized that Bob never actually called the delivery guy and that I should ask him about it next time I go in edit. Thought I had stated this, but my pizza was a plain one. The one thing people naturally assume once they find out I'm Hawaiian is that I like pineapple on my pizza. I hate that. It's an abomination of pizza and good taste. Edit too. So I went down there earlier today to see how things turned out and Bob was there. He's always there. Might even live there for all I know, along with the guy who was delivering last night. Bob said he got another angry call from Karen when she got home, not long after I left, so she didn't live too far away herself. And she was furious that the pizza wasn't there when she got home, not realizing that there were other stops on this guy's route. After she hung up, Bob called the delivery guy and filled him in on her and told him to ring once and leave it. Delivery guy gets to Curran's lair and can hear her spawn playing video games loudly. Not just the game, but the kids were yelling at other people playing online. So delivery guy decides to ring once. Wait a minute, no one answered the door and just left her order on her welcome mat. Neither have heard from Karen again, so for all they know, it's still out there. Oh, and for those out there who are apparently in shock that a Hawaiian doesn't like pineapple on his pizza, two things. First, it didn't originate in Hawaii. It was a Canadian who first did it, so blame Canada. Second, my father grew up in New York, so I guess I inherited my fine taste in pizza from him. Little things you need to know. I am a 26-year-old female with a curvy body type, and I have a huge vertical scar from just below my sternum to my navel. I was given the scar because I needed emergency surgery. My life was at risk and there was no other way. Unfortunately, the surgery was botched. I only recently found this out a whole two years after it happened. I needed the surgery because I had a perforated stomach ulcer that was at risk of leaking stomach acid into my abdominal cavity. It would have been a smaller scar, but the surgeon accidentally sliced my liver while cutting me open and caused blood to spill out. I lost three liters of blood. This meant they had to open me up further than planned. Anyways, long story short, I could have died that night, and my scar is my battle wound. I'm quite proud of it. It shows that I survived, and I think it's cool. It's also been two years since the surgery and the scar has healed nicely. It's not nasty looking, and it will fade more in time. Now back to the main reason for this post. I went to visit family a couple days ago since restrictions in my area aren't as bad anymore. It also helps that my family agreed to only invite the vaccinated members. Well, my aunt's house has a pool in the backyard, and we were hanging out back there, and I was wearing a crop top. It, of course, showed off my scar, which I didn't think was an issue. Everyone was having a good time when my second cousin Melanie came over, pointed her finger at my stomach, and gestured in a vertical sense, clearly referring to my scar. She then made a face and said, Can you cover up, please? Your scar is triggering me, and it's not okay for children to see because it represents violence. I'm just standing there with my other cousin Shannon, both of us wide-eyed over her phrase. I'm sorry, what violence does my scar represent? I asked her how it was triggering. Now I'm autistic and sometimes obvious, social cues don't make it to my brain, and my whole family is aware of this. And she full-on says, uh, so your scar is just ruining the atmosphere and my children won't stop asking me questions about it. Like, not everything has to be about you. I told her that I was sorry it made her uncomfortable, 
but that she and her kids didn't have to look at the scar and that I was not going to cover up because I wasn't ashamed of my body. She then huffs at me like the big bad wolf who was never invited in the first place. There's a reason why no one invites her and yells at me in front of the family. I asked you politely to cover up your ugly scar. Don't you understand how rude you are being to me? I told you your scar triggers me and you should just try for once to not think about yourself. You are obviously trying to be the center of attention at my family's pool party by flaunting your accidents at everyone. We all know you only had that surgery to get reactions from people. Then she stormed off like a toddler would. I went back to hanging out with our family and everyone just laughed her behavior off. She was being a brat. No surprise there. I brushed it off, but every time Melanie had to walk past me, she would say you over and over so everyone could hear her tantrum. Finally, I had enough when I heard her loudly explain to her children that their mommy's cousin has Munchausen's that I pulled her aside and flat out ripped into her in front of everyone and her kids who were preteen brats. And I said, you know what, Melanie, grow up. You're 37 years old and you're being a bully. You're clearly ruining this get together for your own personal gain. And I'm sick of your nonsense. Either grow up and get over the fact that people have lives that don't involve you or get out and leave. No one wants you here anyways. She then started to fake cry. It was so fake it hurt and boo-hooed about how mean I am, how all this could have been avoided if I hadn't shown up in the first place. Most of my family agree that she had crossed the line, but say that I shouldn't have snapped at her so publicly. I do think it might have been tactless to yell at her in front of her kids, but I did suggest for them to run off and get their shoes while I spoke to their mom. They just didn't listen. So, this story is a little out of character for me. For those who saw my post on Mock, I'm the girl who had a teacher think I was faking an asthma attack. In said post, it's pretty clear I'm a timid, non-confrontational person. But this weekend, something just snapped, and while I feel bad for the raccoon, it was fine by the way, just spooked. I have never regretted this incident. Context. Here in Canada, we have a program called the Cadet Program. It's for ages 12, 18, and for many acts as a gateway into the military. It's not part of the military. It's a civilian organization, but it's structured as close as it can get. This includes having air, army, and sea branches. I was an air cadet. While it introduced kids to the many activities of their respective military branches, no one was forced into it by any means. It also offered a lot of other activities and learning opportunities that would benefit civilian life and life in general, such as effective speaking, leadership, teamwork, etc. The adults running it had officer ranks, lieutenant, captain, etc. The cadets had in co-ranks, air cadet, leading air cadet, corporal, flight corporal, sergeant, flight sergeant, warrant officer, second class. I got to hear woo, warrant officer, first class. Any of you wondering how timid, non-confrontational people got to higher ranks, it was because I was fairly laid back and made friends with most of the kids there. That you only have to call me by my rank in front of the officers kind of person. And wouldn't you know it, people tend to be more inclined to do things when you're friendly and ask nicely. Context over, sorry, it was so long. This story takes place four years ago when I was 17 during a field training exercise, Reed Camping Trip, where senior cadets, sergeant, and higher plus officers would teach survival training. Me being a flight sergeant at the time of the trip was in charge of one of the tents and some of the teaching. I was supposed to only teach how to use a radio and snare setting, but we'll get to why I had to do more. In our squadron, we had a few people around my age who were, to put it bluntly, complete jerks. Ignoring our warrant officer, she was a witch. We had a jerk of a flight sergeant, Sergeant DK, and Corporal Brownnauser, Canadian slang, deck is faking out or dodging, like in hockey. Brownnauser is a suck-up. These three were best buds. Well, the corporal was only there because they could push him around. Poor guy. The flight sergeant was technically higher than me since he was promoted before I was and loved to rub it in. Since his buddy Sergeant DK didn't want to do his work and instead just goof off and chat, guess who got stuck doing it instead? On top of radio and snares, I was now also in charge of fire maintenance, shelter building and sows, make big notes for pilots, set a big yet controlled fire. Thankfully, I got assigned to a tent with a group of guys I was friends with all younger than me, by the way. I was the highest rank in the tent, and as such was in charge of it, the cadets in it, and was responsible for their safety. These three cock weasels were put in a tent together with three other young cadets, two of which were new. Throughout the weekend, they continued to dump responsibility, including their own group's tent. Five, six cadets a tent, talk down and belittle me and others under the flight sergeant's rank, and be overall cock weasels, and that along with a lot of pressure and stress going on in my life at the time, caused something to snap. And the last night we were there, I got my chance to act on my newfound craving for revenge. During the weekend, I had expressly forbid food from being in my tent, as I didn't want an uninvited guest, and I was in charge of these kids' safety. 
I didn't want them to endanger themselves by being stupid. Well, they were stupid. One of them had food in his bag. I didn't find out till I was woken up by one of the said cadets because there was a raccoon sitting in our tent eating it. Two of them were freaking out, cowering in the corner. The other three were staying very still once they woke me up. I took my bag, emptied it of all the clothing I had in it. Backpacks made good pillows when you only have a sleeping bag. And scooped it up, closing the flap and holding it shut. Not a zippered bag. As I left my tent to release it back into the woods, I saw the flight sergeant at his friend's tent, and that craving to get back at them emerged again. I'm not proud of what I did next. I don't regret it, but it was definitely a horribly mean thing to do. I went up to their tent, unzipped the flap a little, shook my bag a bunch, and held it up to the opening letting go of the flap, and ran like hell back to my tent before anyone saw. Cue screaming and people waking up just as I entered my tent again. I tell the kids to stay in the tent while I see what's happening and go out to act like I'm only just responding to whatever's happened. As officers and a few other seniors show up, the six guys run from their tent. The raccoon bolts out of it with a bag of chips in its mouth and runs off into the woods. The tent was a disaster. Sleeping bags had rips and scratches. Stuff was strewn around the tent, including food. And the guys were shaken and a little scratched up. They got chewed out for being so irresponsible and for agitating the creature as if you just reacted calmly. It never would have attacked their protests fell on deaf ears. No one found out it was me. And incidentally, none of the cadets in my tent reported a raccoon had gotten in, as they didn't want to get chewed out by our company. I later told them the truth when they asked me during a normal training night once. We had a laugh about it, and nothing was ever said to the officers. They were still jerks afterward, but it felt great knowing I was the cause of their misfortune that night. Since this summer, I started working at the most popular zoo in my country in our capital city. A little bit of background information about the zoo. We have this separate museum area that is part of the zoo's company, but not part of the actual zoo itself, and you have to buy separate tickets for that museum visit. It closes at 5 p.m. We also have a planetarium which is inside of the zoo, which you can visit for free. There's a show slash movie about the universe every hour that lasts for 30 minutes. The zoo closes at 6 during normal weekdays, and so the final planetarium show starts at 5 p.m., ending at 5.30 p.m., ending at 5.30 p.m., so the visitors will still have 30 minutes left to leave the zoo. So, this American family, which consisted of a mother, a father, and two very loud young boys, bought tickets for the zoo and for the museum at 3 p.m. They first wanted to visit the zoo, and we told them that the museum closes at 5, so we recommended they visit the museum first. But the boys were screaming that they wanted to see the animals, so they insisted they'd visit the zoo first. And so they did. We had also told them about the planetarium shows and how the final one is at 5. Then at 4.45 p.m., they suddenly rush into the museum and demand to be let in, despite the fact that we actually don't let people into the museum anymore after 4.30. They yelled at the museum staff that they had bought tickets and had a right to be let in. And when the museum staff still told them that they should have visited earlier and that they were already closing down, the parents literally told their kids to run into the museum. So they got in, and the museum staff had to let the parents in as well. So the museum staff let them in under the pretense that they really had to leave at 5 p.m. Fifteen minutes later, the staff walks up to the family and tells them they're closed now and that they had to leave. They threw a fit and refused to leave. Security had to come in to literally escort them out of the premises, and they were yelling and cursing at the security guy the entire time. I was working the cash register slash administration desk at the time, and the couple walked up to the office and angrily demanded that they'd be given free tickets to the museum for the next day because they didn't get their money's worth, because they couldn't see everything of the museum in 15 minutes, even though they knew the museum would close at 5 and they knowingly only went at 4.45. They threatened to sue us if we didn't give them free tickets. My manager eventually did agree to give them the free tickets for just the museum for the following day. So the family left, and we thought that was the end of it. Boy, oh boy, were we wrong? Ten minutes later, they came back, angry again because they missed the final show of the planetarium since it was now 5.20. Again, the planetarium and all its shows are for free. They didn't pay for that. That is included in Zoo Ticket. We told them that and reminded them that we had told them that the final show would be at 5. And still, they threw another temper tantrum and then demanded that they'd be given free Zoo Tickets as well for the next day, along with the free museum ticket we had already agreed to give them, because they claimed they also didn't get their money's worth, because they missed all the planetarium shows, which they knew the final time of. So... They knew about the museum closing at 5 and still decided to only arrive at 4.45. They also knew that the final planetarium show would start at 5 and didn't go to any earlier ones either. This was all their own doing, and still they demanded that we give them free tickets for their lack of time management. 
My manager thankfully didn't put up with their final request and told them that we could not give them free zoo tickets because they missed a free event, especially since they knew about the final showtime. The couple, of course, threw a temper tantrum and cursed at us, threatening to sue us. Good luck doing that in a country where lawsuits like that literally never happen. They demanded to speak to the manager and my team manager dropped the biggest I am the manager that I've ever witnessed. I was just listening to it all behind my cash register with a dropped jaw. The children started crying and the couple accused us of making them cry and ruining their vacation. They literally said, you just ruined the vacation of our children. They also accused us of horrible customer service and that we weren't helping them at all, even though we had literally just given them free tickets to the museum. So we ended up having to call security again to escort the family out of the zoo and my team manager ended up revoking their free ticket for the museum as well for how incredibly rudely they behave. Good on her. She's an awesome manager.